Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Mythbusters Uncovering Truths About Behavioral Health Crisis Care. Today, we're embarking on our final session focused on sustainability and return on investment. My name is Miranda Green, and I'm a clinical consultant with TBD Solutions and a member of the Crisis Residential Association. Today's panel will be recorded, and a link to the recording as well as the slide deck will be made available to all registered participants. Details about how to obtain the recording and the slides will be shared at the conclusion of the webinar. A little bit of housekeeping. Attendees' cameras and microphones are disabled for the duration of the webinar. We encourage everyone to engage within the Q&A feature. Um, we'll be monitoring the Q&A, so any questions entered into the questions box um, will be viewed by those moderating today's event. Now on to the good stuff. Today's panel is hosted by TBD Solutions. TBD Solutions is a Michigan-based behavioral health consulting organization. The company believes that every community member deserves access to high-quality behavioral health services. TBD Solutions helps make this a reality by working with organizations of all sizes to answer difficult questions through consultation, research, and training. The company's core expertise represents a rich background in research, organizational leadership, healthcare policy analysis, strategic planning, process refinement, outcomes management systems, quality improvement, and technology-based analytic and visualization solutions. TBD Solutions also has a unique specialty in crisis system design, development, and measurement. <clears throat> we would also like to give a very big thank you to those organizations supporting today's event. First is the Crisis Resi Residential Association, or the CRA. CRA exists to support the operational and clinical function of crisis residential programs around the world. Rooted in the values of empathy, recovery, and continuous improvement, the association seeks to connect providers with the best ideas in behavioral health treatment to transform the way people receive mental health care. We'd also like to thank the National Organization of Crisis Organization Directors, or NASCAD, which is an organization for social service professionals serving as executive directors or program directors of crisis organizations. NASCAD's mission is to provide support and professional development for executive directors and program managers. We, they arrange trainings, they promote professional development, and serve as advocates and provide other pr appropriate services. We'd also like to thank the American Association of Suicidology, or AAS, which exists to promote the understanding and prevention of suicide and support for those who have been affected by suicide. AAS is an inclusive community that envisions a world where people know how to prevent suicide and find hope as well as healing. And finally, a big thank you to International Council for Helplines, formerly Contact USA. International Council for Helplines is a helpline membership organization with a mission to inspire, educate, and accredit helpline programs, which offer support to individuals in crisis and emotional distress. Their vision is that anyone at any time can have access to thriving, effective emotional support. ICH promotes unconditional regard for acceptance of all people. So thank you to those organizations for helping to make today possible. And I'm now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Travis Atkinson. Travis is a licensed professional counselor, father, husband, coach, and musician. Travis is the director of clinical and crisis services at TBD Solutions, and he is a career student of crisis systems. He serves as a president of the Crisis Residential Association and the Crisis, crisis Services Committee co-chair for AAS. I think you might be muted, Travis. Well, I just wanted to get that out of the way quickly, but thank you, Miranda, uh, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here with you. My name is Travis Atkinson, uh, and we are hosting the third and final uh, webinar of our Mythbusters series, where we're talking about what the experience is like of crisis providers to provide care and how to provide some clarity and uh, dispel some misunderstandings about how exactly crisis services work. Uh, so we were fortunate uh, to have uh, some wonderful panel, uh, panel members in the last uh, few weeks or month of our previous webinars and uh, today is no exception. We will have uh, some wonderful panelists that I'm excited to introduce you to. Uh, as we take this journey and, and hear about crisis services from the perspective of the, the providers um, and the uh, advisors of these systems, those uh, on the ground who are um, living it every day so that we can understand the true nuance of these crisis services. <clears throat> 
So I imagine if you're joining us today on this webinar, you are um, uh, in some kind of helping capacity. Maybe that's as a provider, as a payer, as an administrator, as an advocate, as a person with lived experience. And uh, you know, we're all trying to answer that question of how can we be the most helpful when it comes to providing support to people who are in a behavioral health crisis. Um, and we do that in a number of different ways and we try to uh, stretch our resources sometimes as thin as we can knowing that they are finite and we wanna help the most people but help the most people in a really high quality fashion. Um, but there's a there's a, a well-known saying in the nonprofit community and in, and in some social service agencies which is no money, no mission. If we don't have the resources that we need, it doesn't matter how good our ideas are. It doesn't matter how um, passionate we are or how um, well connected we are either within our organizations or as part of a community. If we don't have the money to do what we need to do, we can't complete the mission of our collective organizations or of, uh, of a crisis services continuum. We have so many sources to look at nowadays, especially in the past 10 or 15 years. Um, most of these documents have come out during that time. And uh, it, it's hard to know what exactly to believe or what is truth, or sometimes how to um, take a policy idea and turn it into a, a practice idea. Um, so uh, we, we recognize that there's a lot of uh, messaging that's happening right now around crisis services. The good news is it's never been, um, in my opinion, a better time to be in crisis services because of the attention that it's getting and the subsequent funding uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, may be coming down the line here in a very short period of time. But we have to uh, be very conscientious about how we make improvements or enhancements to our system. And the financing and the sustainability of these services uh, is what we will be talking about a little bit today. <clears throat> So, so our webinar series here is based on two ideas. This, this idea, first of all, that, that practice-based evidence should not be um, undersold, that the experience of the provider, um, the experience of the community needs to be heard and represented. And communities of, of different types, um, <clears throat> excuse me, urban and rural, um, different um, uh, cultural makeups <clears throat> to make sure that the models that we're describing or recommending um, are helpful for all people. And then of course, there's the evidence-based practice side. What does the research tell us about crisis services and, and how far back does that research go? And can we learn things from what happened in the early days of these crisis services that will aid and, and, um, and assist us in our development today? The primary services that we're going to focus on, as we have in all of these uh, Mythbusters webinars, are the crisis call centers, mobile crisis teams, crisis residential programs, and peer respite programs. <clears throat> and we are fortunate to have uh, representatives from some of these uh, of these service types on our panel today, and we've had all of these services represented uh, throughout the webinar series. Uh, but when we talk about crisis care, we think it's really important to include these types of care in the continuum. And one of the reasons is that uh, we have come to an understanding or a realization that oftentimes the most helpful crisis systems are built around the experience of the person who's in crisis. That shouldn't come as a surprise to many of you. Um, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, that the crisis is defined by the person. It's defined by the person who's experiencing the crisis, not necessarily by um, just a set of severity of illness and intensity of service criteria, for example. And so if, if we're allow, allowing the individual to define when they are in crisis, then we can say with some certainty about what services are or are not crisis services based on how and when people are accessing them. Um, so I won't go in too much uh, detail of these services, and, and I'll actually let our panelists describe uh, some of the services that they represent or that they have, um, you know, pr provided uh, support in. Um, but uh, hopefully you're familiar with, with all of these service types. And just to give even a little bit more detail, this is a breakdown of approximately how many of these services there are in the United States. About 100 crisis call centers, excuse me, 800 crisis call centers, about 800 crisis residential programs, 
about 500 mobile crisis teams. Now, I don't know how good the resolution is on the screen that you're watching today or if you're watching on your phone. Uh, when I showed this slide to one of our panelists, he said that the, the two hands together actually looked like bacon. Um, so if it's lunchtime and you're about to make a BLT, you know, this presentation's working in perfectly for you. Um, if it's making you hungry and you don't have access to bacon, I apologize. Um, but those actually are two hands, kind of, uh, you know, one over the other, um, respecting whatever uh, social distancing regulations you are uh, experiencing in your community at the time. Then we have 23-hour crisis stabilization units. Now, there are less than 200 of these across the country. And then lastly, we have peer respite facilities. And there's about 50 to 70 uh, of these, depending on what you consider uh, constitutes a peer respite program. So I show this to you because, first of all, many people don't know this. Many people don't know the numbers or the count of the crisis services. Um, but also, um, sometimes we don't have to look far to see where the effective solutions have been within the crisis continuum. Um, and sometimes the experts might be represented in these programs that are uh, well represented, let's say, in the United States. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. And uh, panelists, feel free to, um, to pull up your video and uh, take yourselves off of, of mute as I um, introduce you. So first is Tracy Abzug. Hi. Hello, yeah. welcome. Um, I'm welcome. just trying to uh, adjust my um, my GoToWebinar screen here so I can see everybody. Great. So Tracy is a licensed clinical social worker and currently oversees a continuum of crisis residential programs at Integral Care in Austin, Texas. Uh, as a clinician with over 13 years experience in behavioral health, most being in a supervisory or management capacity, Tracy's professional interests are in serious mental illness, psychiatric crisis intervention, and systemic influence. Uh, in collaboration with a local economist at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, L LBJ School of Public Affairs and Psychiatrist at UT Austin Dell Medical School, Tracy is a co-author of a paper that has been accepted for publication in Psychiatric Services titled Economic Evaluation of a Crisis Residential Program in Austin, Texas. Welcome, Tracy. The next is Todd Nowak. Todd is, uh, the, is a certified peer specialist and a founder of Life Connections Peer Recovery Services. Uh, he has 12 years of experience delivering recovery training and support services to peers throughout Iowa. He now oversees the organization in running Iowa's first and only peer respite from the ground up. Todd, welcome. And last, we have Hudson Harris. Hudson is a skilled communicator and designer whose success is rooted in his diverse background, his experience with human-centered design, and his ability to build a shared understanding and drive change. Um, in late 2019, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors brought Hudson on to create the strategy for the redesign of the regional behavioral health system. Today, Hudson's role as a population health strategist is on launching mobile crisis outreach, integrated care coordination, and cross-sector data sharing. Hudson, welcome. It is a pleasure to have all of you here. So um, I provided a map in case that was, uh, you know, testing your geographical knowledge of, of that you might have learned in fourth or fifth grade. Um, but here is where our panelists are located. And I just want to get things kicked off um, by having each of you talk a little bit about the work that you do in your communities or the work that you've done in crisis services. And so I'm going to start with um, Todd. Todd, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about um, the work that you do in your community and tell us more about your peer respite program. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here today. So like he said, uh, Travis is a I've trained a lot of peer specialists in the state and been a huge advocate for the change. Uh, I, I seen the need a few years ago for community-based services to expand. Uh, and one of the things that I knew about was peer respite. So that was the ultimate goal. But in the meantime, I built the first uh, peer-run wellness recovery center that served people when the clock went off most of the time at other places. So we run uh, a wellness recovery center that's open during the week from 5 to 10 p.m. at night. 
community support groups, we have a computer lab, one-on-one -on -one peer support, many things, uh, resources. And then we're open also on Saturday and Sunday, noon to five. But the actual dream came true um, a couple years ago, about two and a half years ago. And we did with the support of our region, our five counties, um, with the support of our national technical assistance, was able to open up the first respite in Iowa. And from what I've been told, it's the first one in the United States that in, is in such a rural area. Uh, we have this town is about 5,000 people. We serve the whole five county region. And people, when we opened it, was curious on why I wanted to open it up in this town where a lot of farmers are, uh, school teachers. And, and that is really because we have so many services and bus routes in the bigger cities that we really leave the rural area out of a lot of things. And, you know, with the people we serve, transportation is a barrier, phone is a barrier, internet is a barrier. So the other reason was to have a true peer respite in what it does is to have that calming, that relaxing, that place where nobody knows you and you know our neighbors are not you know having the police call so when people come out here um, as it says on the slide here this is a sign that i have that's above our patio um, going into the closed-in patio that we have and it truly is enter strangers leave as friends and many people have said it's entering as strangers and leaving as family and that truly is what we are, right? My peers are all my brothers and sisters. Um, sometimes we have our immediate family, but my family is extended with the peers. And as you see in the uh, picture that's here, that was the grand opening. And the lady that is holding the sign for Rhonda's house, we named Rhonda's house after a huge advocate in the state that I worked with. Um, she was eight days older th than me and had died um, a year prior to opening. And we wanted to come up with a name for the house. So if we were to take that S at the end of Rhonda's and move it in front of the H, that was actually her name. So it really has a legacy. Rhonda's house is after Rhonda Schaus and all the advocacy that she led in the state of Iowa. Thank you, Travis. That's beautiful, Todd. I just I want to <clears throat> touch on one more thing because many of our attendees may just not be familiar with the the peer respite model, and what you're describing sounds very countercultural to what we've experienced in the mental health system when it comes to um, you know um, uh, you know not not using language about like family or friends, but like I'm the client, you're the person receiving care. This this sounds fundamentally different than that. Um, what's the what's the hardest thing for people to wrap their mind around when they learn about your program or even when they you know come for the first time? Uh, you, you bring up a good point. Uh, language is a, a big barrier sometimes, and you know the the folks that we see have never experienced anything like this. They're so used to being told what they need to do, what they have to do. Uh, it, take for instance when somebody calls, we don't do intakes. What we do as peers is we do a registration and make reservations. Uh, it, it truly is that language, right? Um, the barrier. And one of the things that we help support the individuals in is understanding and learning how to advocate for themselves and how to really change that language. Uh, a lot of folks come in and they say, yeah, I'm bipolar. We mess with them and we say, well, my name's Todd, nice to meet you, bipolar, right? It's getting that mindset out of there that you are not your diagnosis. We don't walk around telling people that, you know, they're cancer, right? And, and really changing that aspect of it. And, and I wanna to touch on one thing that's really important, you know, I think we put a lot of money into crisis services, but I think we put a lot of money into the crisis services that we know works. Right. When we don't know something like peer respite and we're a little cautious, we're anxious. Uh, these are people with lived experience. Uh, man, they just can't do what we do. We don't. We definitely don't. 
we help them build skills. And last week we did a uh, two day call through all of our guests and out of 77 guests that we were able to make contact with, and most of them have used the hospital, 74, 73 of them did not have to use the hospital since they've left Ronnie's house. That's tremendous. Thank you, Todd. We're gonna and we're gonna dive in more a little bit about the the um, the, the function of your program, but also the the sustainability and the return on investment. Um, let's go to Tracy next. Tracy, tell us about uh, Integral Care. Yeah. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am with Integral Care, uh, which is the local mental health and intellectual and developmental disability authority in Austin, Texas. Austin, in this area, we serve a population of over 2 million, and it's a metropolitan-like area. We've got a lot of little suburbs um, that feed into us as well. We've actually recently been tagged, if maybe not recently, for many years now, as one of the top 10 fastest growing cities um, in the nation, which, you know, when you look at mental health services, it means we have to grow with that as well. Um, and integral care is is often expanding and growing um, in 2020 we served close to 30,000 different unique individuals and provided roughly 530,000 services um, so we are uh, meeting the needs of our very large community and constantly preparing and prepping on what expansion looks like. We have roughly 40 different program types across the agency. Um, the, the program division that I work in is our crisis division. Um, and within that division, we have a pretty uh, robust crisis continuum ranging from uh, a crisis hotline, which also fields uh, national suicide hotline phone calls We've got our mobile crisis teams. We have a mobile crisis team that has a specialty of being dispatched by law enforcement and EMS. Um, in 2019, we're really proud of this. We are actually now embedded in our 911 call center. And so our community, when you call 911, not only do you get the option of fire, police, EMS, but you now have a fourth option of requesting mental health. And if you request that option, it goes directly to an integral care staff member, uh, a mental health professional who can help navigate that piece of what's going on and help determine if it's uh, a need for a mental health response or an actual need for a police response. So we've been able to, to field that in a very different way for our community. Um, and the programs that I oversee are our residential continuum of care. As you can see on the slide here, We've got four different sites with actually six different programs um, spanning those sites. Uh, and here they're ranked in, in terms of level of care. So we have an extended observation unit and crisis residential unit. Um, and you'll see here on the right of my slide, the number of individuals served in both 2019 and 2020. You'll see the effects of the pandemic there. Um, we have a hospital and jail diversion re uh, residential program that's 30 beds. We have the inn, which is a residential program, which is 16 beds. And we have a respite facility named Next Step uh, that has actually 32 respite beds. And nine of those beds um, are designated, oh, sorry, an additional nine beds are designated for an outpatient competency restoration program. So we serve individuals who have been waiting in jail for competency restoration services um, and may not necessarily need an inpatient level of care for that restoration. And we can serve them in this different capacity. Thank you, Tracy. I'm always jealous of Texas and the, the continuum of, rice, of crisis residential type care that you have. Um, most states have one of these and you've got three, four, five. It's just uh, really cool. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't want to over, over, um, overlook what was mentioned in your bio. Uh, really excited to have you as part of this conversation because of that study that you engaged in uh, with some of your colleagues that you presented at the, the 2020 Crisis Residential Conference. So uh, really glad to have you here and to talk about these things. Uh, Hudson Harris, you are next. Uh, welcome, 
uh, back, I guess, uh, to our our webinar series. I know you were with us uh, uh, this past year with uh, with the Crisis Residential Association, but tell us about how you interface with uh, crisis services and um, either your journey at San Diego County or um, uh, or other uh, projects that you've been fortunate to be a part of. Yeah, I um, I started my cri my uh, crisis work with Hotline and Mobile Crisis, and uh, working actually on the legal side, doing um, uh, adverse event deconstruction and, and analysis, and then also working on uh, what best practices were, and then ultimately moved into technology and design of how do we enable clinicians to have all of the data that they need without all the static and noise. Um, I'm not a provider. I have, uh, but I do love working with clinicians and I, I bring a very clinician first uh, mentality to all the crisis work and behavioral health work that I do. And much to the chagrin of some of my leadership, that is always how I do it. But the clinicians and the doctors and the people we serve, it seems that that's usually the best approach. After that hotline and mobile crisis work, I did mental health jail diversion work actually in Texas as well, Tracy. I'm a huge fanboy of the work in Austin and did some work with Austin State Hospital redesign. And uh, I, I would love to talk more about that because the work you've done is the stuff that I want to do and I'm trying to bring here to San Diego. Uh, also did work with emergency department diversions in Texas as well. Uh, that was a pretty amazing uh, experience. And then now I do pretty much full-time population behavioral health, which is not really a thing, but I've kind of tried to make it a thing. But looking at behavioral health from a population health lens, how we design better systems of care, how we're using technology to identify trends before they become uh, epidemics, and then how we're really helping people get the types of services they need, where they are, with the right provider at the right time. Uh, and that's kind of what I do. Thank you, Hudson. Uh, very helpful. Um, I'm just gonna get us caught up here on our slides. Okay, we are on to our first poll question. Uh, for our audience, and this is going to inform um, our next question that we'll uh, that we'll bring to to each of y'all. So I'm hitting the launch button right now. Um, hopefully, you can see um, our poll right here, which says, "How are your crisis uh, communities crisis services funded?" So you don't have to work within um, your crisis services in the community in order to answer this question, and you can answer more than one. You can, can provide more than one answer. Okay, so. We've got tax levies, millages, we've got uh, fee-for-service Medicaid reimbursement, we've got grants, commercial health plan, and state grants. So we'll just take um, a moment to have uh, our responses collected and um, I'll let everyone know when we're, uh, looks like we've got about a third of you that have voted so far. So once we get a little bit closer to that, uh, we'll say 60 to 70%, uh, then we'll close the poll. Okay, about three more seconds. Right. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and share the results. All right, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, about <clears throat> the, the, the most common response was uh, fee-for-service Medicaid reimbursement, and 80% of you said that. Uh, followed by tax levies and millages or state grants. And then after that, um, less than a third of you said commercial health plan billing or reimbursement, which is actually pretty high. That's pretty encouraging. Um, and then uh, grants from a phil philanthropic organization. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my um, uh, slides pulled back up. Um, we are, uh, Miranda, just, just so everyone knows, Miranda is in the background kind of responding to Q&A or if people have their hand up. Um, if you do have your hand up, we would recommend that you put your question into um, the the, the Q&A uh, box and then we will field them as we're able to, uh, possibly at the end, but, but, um, but also possibly earlier. Okay. Great, so we've got a sense of, of what, the, what the funding is like, and um, I've been showing a few research articles in our webinar, but I just wanna draw attention to a different component of them uh, in, in, this, in, in this session that we have. So if you've heard of the triple aim of healthcare before, uh, the triple aim is, is predicated on three areas of, of quality in healthcare. One is uh, clinical outcomes, uh, one is uh, cost savings, and one is uh, client satisfaction. 
So there are a number of research articles, both on peer respite and crisis residential programs, as well as other parts of the continuum. But the ones we're going to show have to do with, with crisis residential and peer respite. And what they show is support of those triple aim objectives when you're comparing them to a psychiatric hospital admission. And in this case, we took a quote from one of these, these papers, and it says, acute treatment episode costs was $3,046 in the crisis residential program, 44% lower than the $5,549 episode cost for the general hospital. Incremental cost effectiveness ratios indicate that in most cases, the residential crisis program provides near equivalent effectiveness for significantly less cost. This is important. If you want to save your, your behavioral health uh, system money, you go towards the services that are the most expensive. And in our case, usually it's the psychiatric hospitals. Um, and what we see across the country is that crisis residential type facilities operate at about 60 to 70 percent or, or cost 60 to 70 percent of, of a, a psychiatric inpatient stay. Um, so I um, am going to show the next slide and then get some reaction from our panelists before we, um, uh, before we go into our next question. Well, let's see. I guess I wanted to see that twice. Um, I really like the graphics of them sliding in. It's, do it's you? Not, do. You know, sometimes I have to stay up late after the kids go to bed just to, just so I can make sure they're perfect. So thanks for acknowledging <laughs> that. Um, some some research recently has also demonstrated the cost effectiveness of peer respite facilities, both as diversions from emergency departments as well as from psychiatric hospitals. Uh, this quote said the existing literature suggests that peer respites may lower system costs through reductions in inpatient and emergency services. Um, so let me. Um, uh, get uh, Todd your reaction to that first. You mentioned this this uh, somewhat anecdotal stat, but still something you collected very recently about uh, 73 of 77 people that didn't have to go to the psychiatric hospital. Um, do you get the sense that if people didn't go to your, um, you know, didn't utilize their service, that they might eventually be stepping up into more expensive and intensive services? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and sometimes when we do go to that higher level, like you speak of, Travis, uh, we're not just ready to go home, right? And I, I think about this, like even our jail system, uh, that sometimes when we're releasing them from the hospital, uh, think of that as a, a deep cut on your arm. Are, are we putting a Band-Aid on that cut? Or are we actually getting in there and fi helping support that infection from the inside out? Right? So if we just let them go home, here's your appointment, here's the meds, um, it, you know, they don't have any other support and they're going right back in to do it repetitively. And they do end up in the hospital. And I think of those that go to the ER and they get sent home. One, they were reaching out, they want support, um, but we have to really communicate and let them know that there are other community offerings out there like peer respite, wellness recovery centers, right? Because they need that support. They're looking for that support and they stepped outside their comfort zone. But yes, in thinking about this, um, the average cost at our peer respite is about $248 a day. And we've check the cost on two of the inpatients at the local hospitals. One is $1,800 per day, and the other one is $2,000 a day. So it saves a significant cost, especially if that's coming out of federal dollars, taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, I, I think me as a taxpayer, I would rather pay $248 and, instead of the $2,000. Uh, but the, the most long-term effect, like I said, is that I'm actually supporting with $248, fixing the infection from the inside out so that my tax dollars are being saved. Yeah, and, and Todd, I would imagine if your community doesn't have a peer respite, doesn't have a continuum of crisis residential services like Tracy's talking about, then you're hospitalizing people who don't need to be hospitalized because you don't have a choice, you don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and Hudson and Tracy, I'm gonna I'm gonna tee you up with with our next question because I know that you you have some opinions and some thoughts on this as well. Um, so our second question for a panel is where does the money saved by your crisis services go, 
and is it reinvested into program operations? So Hudson, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna pull up your, your continuum slide and feel free to, to walk us through um, you know, how, you, how you think through the answer to that question. Anna, you might be muted. Can you push the slide one more time so it puts the little, sure. there it is, one more, there it goes. Okay, so this is kind of like how, when I when I talk to organizations about the mental health cycle, and there's another slide after this about how to like kind of reimagine it, um, I talk about how we pull together different pieces and really conceptualize crisis care, not as these indistinct, uh, as these uh, indistinct things that just happen, but as a distinct part of a cycle and how things work through. And so the, the glib answer to your question is, is that nobody knows where the savings go. Like, it's, we, we, we have governments so often that have this use it or lose it mentality that it just disappears. Like I've worked on programs that were netting uh, four, to five, uh, four to five times ROI a year, but no one could ever actually say this is where the money went. There were a couple of times you were able to track down in the justice system where they were able to close pods or able to do some things like that. But that's one of the big problems we have as a behavioral health community is we have to be able to not only demonstrate our, our, our ROI uh, and say it apparently, but also be able to then track where the money is going and then reinvest it in appropriate ways. So I use this as kind of a very like introductory slide of like this is how to conceptualize what people are going through in a poorly designed uh, mental health cycle. Uh, yeah. And then this is the really like this is the this is the better one. This is the one that I've been working on with San Diego on. And so the idea here is is that we we recognize that a lot of times you know be, you know behavioral health recovery is nonlinear and multivariate. But what we want to try and do is keep people on the side of the uh, of this uh, diagram that gives them the most chance of independence and success while recognizing that things are going to happen. Um, I can't tell you the number of arguments and conversations, I'm sorry, the number of meetings that I've had with law enforcement that recidivism should be used as an indicator of success in behavioral health. And that's when I say, well, but that's wrong. Like, you know, if you're trying to do something, you're going to have lapses, you're going to have things that are going on. It's really more important to look at things in the total, uh, the totality of the circumstances. So this, this is one of the things that I use to really look at the power of diversion, diversion into crisis residential, diversion away from, you know, hospitals and jails. You know, as a country, half the time the police show up at your door, you're going to go to jail or the hospital. And that's ridiculous. With communities that have well-established, well-functioning mobile crisis and hotlines, those numbers should be 80% plus. Um, I worked in a community that had a 93% community-based diversion rate. And so part of the challenge here is how not only are we conceptualizing the system, because it's a good, someone said, was talking earlier about, you know, the clinical models. I've said this a hundred times in meetings, a good clinical model does not a business plan make. We have to be able to demonstrate the ROI. We have to be able to demonstrate the human impact and then why we should do this and then pitch it in a way that can build support and gather the community around something. And so this is one of the ways that I show that, that we recognize the journey that people are on, but then the goal is really how do we keep people on the left side here? So they're using their own self coping mechanisms, but when they do have an event, there's diversion and care coordination, but sometimes they do have to get help. So yeah. That's my slide. Hudson, I want to make sure that that, pe that our audience is not losing this point, that you said in some communities, they can experience a 93% diversion rate. That's so the that best I've ever seen in the community. So that means if mobile crisis uh, rolls out, 93% of the time you're staying in your home. And I've heard numbers similar in states like New Jersey with their youth MRSS teams, which is mobile mm -hmm. response and stabilization services. Um, by the way, some communities prefer not to use the word crisis because it inhibits people's uh, uh, propensity to use the service. They think, well, I'm not in crisis, I'm just experiencing this, you know? And so for some, crisis provides clarity as to what the service is. For others, it provides confusion. So the MRSS teams serving youth in New Jersey have gotten a 95% diversion rate, keeping the families preserved because that's they've identified what their priority is. Keep the families together, you know, keep people in their home. Let's do wraparound services. Let's have two visits a week for the next four weeks until the outpatient appointments begin, you know, whatever it is, but but it, this is possible. And when the, when the incentives are aligned, um, we, we shouldn't just, we shouldn't settle for, for these, these lower amounts and be like, well, we tried. Um, we can do a lot together when, when it's built the right way. Well, and just to piggyback on that as one piece, you know, and some of the research and work that I've, I've been a part of, if somebody spends the night in jail, so it's like an eight to 12 hour window, if they're there for that period of time, 
their odds of returning with a, me a mental health condition, their odds of returning in six months are as high as 67%. If you're discharged from a uh, inpatient facility after a 72 hour hold, your highest, your highest risk of suicide, your highest risk of justice involvement, your highest risk of relapse are all within defined windows thereafter. And this is like my favorite Greek word is iatrogenic and like going into inpatient, this, Travis laughs at me because like I'm trying to make this a thing, but like it's the iatrogenic effect is that the treatment is worse than the condition is that when we're putting people into these facilities and we're putting them into uh, involuntary holds, a lot of times their risk levels for the very thing we're trying to help them with go way up for 30, 60, 90 and six months after. And so it's something we really have to look at what we're doing from that perspective. I was only laughing, Hudson, because I just footnoted that word for somebody else that I was writing a report for, and uh, it does need to be used a lot, a lot more in our system. Um, is there anything you want to talk about as far as um, this graphic or your? Um, oh my gosh, it's a video. You sent it's me not, a video. I didn't realize it was a video. I'm sorry. So I just want to show this that this is the power of technology and the power of partnering. One of the things I really encourage organizations to do is if you're using a software go call the people you're using it with and be like, hey, I wanna innovate with you. Hey, I wanna try this with you. Like Salesforce does it, this was built with SAP, uh, EHRs do it, and there's so much power in just asking. This, this, what you see here was the product of 12 months and over a million dollars worth of research and development to create a de-identification and anonymization algorithm, which means that the data was completely masked and uh, noised out, you couldn't identify it, from uh, CMS, criminal justice, crisis, behavioral health, and hotline, and then rematched in the cloud without identifying who it was to create regional heat maps of crisis. So we could see where people were coming from, where they were going, their outpatient connection rates, their readmission rates. Um, even We were even able to get down to what people's readmission rates were relative to their distance to their provider. Meaning if my provider's 50 miles away, am I more likely to go back to the hospital sooner? So this was completely free. SAP funded this entire thing. And it's it's something that I it's one of the things I'm most proud of because you could see this is North Texas this was uh, a lot of data but it really gives you a good insight as to where things are happening when it's what's going down and even like costs and average duration and then there was a provider calculator later on that was like how to calculate what each provider was doing and what was driving their higher level of care events. And I'm going to come back to that provider calculator but I want uh, to to have Tracy weigh in because I imagine Tracy you have. Uh, a couple of thoughts here on ROI and the economic uh, benefits of crisis services. Yeah, it's it's fun being a part of this because I feel like I'm with my people. We all get it. Um, <laughs> so Hudson said some things that I was going to say, so I won't repeat that um, as it relates to, you know, where does the money go that we save? Um, that was a question that we had. And so we ended up um, about a year and a half ago at this point, partnering uh, with our uh, local University of Texas and a health economist, Todd, Todd Olmsted, yeah, <laughs> um, and, and some other uh, participants to really dive in and look at what is the economic value of a residential program. So we particularly looked at the inn, which is our 16 bed, one of our 16 bed residential facilities. Um, and sliced it in three different ways in terms of analyses. We looked at pre and post cost index. We looked at cost savings to the healthcare system, and we looked at cost savings to integral care itself. Um, in summary, for each of those uh, analyses, interesting to me, um, there wasn't much of a notable cost savings uh, pre and post index of um, whether it be a hospital stay or a stay at a residential program. So what that helps us kind of deduce is the savings is actually happening at the level of the service point. So we know that um, a residential program is uh, less costly than an inpatient hospital. So some of the, the points that have already been made up to this point showed that, that difference. So what we were looking at is that we know it costs about $3,000 per episode at the inn, whereas when you're looking at an episode of care at an inpatient setting is a little more around 5,000 and upwards of that. Um, so just looking at that alone, we see that there's a, a cost savings. Um, 
in terms of length of stay, we noticed that there's about a, a similar length of stay there as well. Um, so again, that cost savings is really related to the cost of operation and overhead of the different types of facilities, programs. Um, so when we boiled it down, what we were able to identify is that it costs um, integral care $1.7 million annually to provide care at the inn. Um, if we were to pay a hospital that instead, um, we would be looking at nearly $3 million. Um, so if the cost savings uh, for integral care, we're looking at um, $1.2 million. Um, and if we were to look at that a little bit differently, you know, per episode, we're saving uh, roughly $2,000 per episode by utilizing this residential program versus an inpatient psychiatric setting. Um, and, you know, when you're reviewing the literature, what we see is that most crises resolve within 48 hours. And so when we're able to divert and shift crisis services, to this less costly intervention. I, I mean, I think that it speaks for itself what the what the benefit of that is. That's powerful, Tracy. And I imagine the systems that are that are not being studied are also saving communities a lot of money. And they they and subsequently our providers need to get more wise to how do we demonstrate this? You know, how can we replicate some of the some of the concepts that are in your paper? Let me ask you this: Has has your paper been published yet? Has it has it gone into one of the? It's been approved for publishing, so we're just waiting for it to happen. Okay, please <laughs> yeah. share that with the community because I, I that is that's going to be some hot literature for us. And, and probably from what I can tell, the first uh, crisis residential type published literature in in almost ten years. So really uh -huh. encouraging to hear that so, Todd, right. so let's with go. literature oh sorry no go ahead, go ahead. On, on one more little soapbox um as you can imagine there isn't a lot of literature out there so yes here's the plug to you know if you've got that opportunity um those innovative you know collaborations to to do this um it, it would just really help build this um this lack of, of research that we already have. Um, and also just to go back to the that question of where does the money go in the system, I really appreciate what you said, Hudson. It's like we have no idea. You know, one of the things that that happens that we've already identified is we have so many different funding sources to help support and and hold up these different programs that you know we can you know anecdotally identify who and where those cost savings go but it is it was really difficult to really pinpoint where that happens and in what amount well and the the crisis the crisis residential calculator webinar that we did a couple of months ago i've lost all sense of time in the past year and a half so i have no idea if that was last week or three months but it originally came from a mental health jail diversion program that had netted a four and a half times roi and HHS wanted to cut it. They're like, well, you did so great, we'll cut your funding. They saved four and a half million dollars in one year, and they wanted to cut their funding from 1.3 million to 750,000. And I was like, but that doesn't make any sense. But they couldn't justify it or rationalize it or show it until we made this whole calculator, which there's somewhere in here, there's a slide on that. But like, that's the whole key. You have to be able to show the politicians where the money is. Hmm. Todd, I, I, it sounds like that the, the potential savings between a peer respite and a psychiatric inpatient is even more extreme than what Tracy described of you know two thousand dollars per episode. You're talking about something closer to fifteen hundred dollars per day um, in the two or three years or four years that your uh, peer respite's been in operation. Um, has that conversation come up with your funders where you're saying, "Hey, we're saving people money. Uh, do we know where that money's going, and can we have some assurance that it's going back into the operation of of our program?" You know, I want to say yes, but I have to say no. And, you know, I, I think that's it, right? Is is we're so worried, let, let's just fund it, let's get that service, let's let's try to fix it. Uh, that we don't stop and, and look at them things. Like I said, the stories of individuals. Did this help you? Did you end up back in the hospital? Did you end up back in jail? Following that person like we do. Uh, you know, we follow that person. 
Uh, and we also have people that they stay at the respite and, you know, we have a level of training that we know. Uh, and if they need a higher level of training, we work very closely with our mobile crisis, our crisis system, our crisis stabilization house, our hospital, for goodness sakes, I won't get into it now, but the, the way we opened our peer respite is our local hospital in this town uh, owns a home and let us use one of the homes. Uh, so they seen the difference, but no, nobody has ever come to say, you know, how much money have you saved us by tracking where they would have went instead? And I wish that conversation would start. I've tried to share that even with our political leaders in our state. Um, you know, I, I think the system would love to hear that story. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Um, Hudson, I wanna come back to you uh, one more slide here before we get into our, um, our next poll question. And okay. this is an ROI calculator. Uh, tell us about this. So this, this, I adopted this from the uh, mental health jail diversion program that I uh, worked with, but this is a pre and post analysis of ROI for a crisis, for, for a crisis residential diversion. So the very top uh, blue number, so you change the blue numbers, the black numbers all update based upon whatever you do in the blue. So monthly inpatient events. And then Travis, I think we built this on the numbers that you guys gave me uh, before the thing. So basically the first, Diversions, HLOC, high levels of care and cost, treatment as usual. So this is assuming a, a standard 50% diversion from uh, uh, the ED into inpatient. So that half the people that are going to ED are going to go home, half the people that are going to be in the ED are going to go to inpatient. And the one down below is a 90% diversion, meaning that 90% of the people will be going either home or residential. And like, this is super basic. I am not a numbers person, trust me. But like this calculator has like wowed people be like, I didn't think about it like this, but I will happily send this out. Travis has copies of it. But this type of thinking creates really clear, clean data visualizations that help people understand like, wow, this is how much we could be saving. The first time I showed this to a public defender on what we were spending in mental health uh, offender costs, they were blown away. And they're like, but that's too high. I go, but I cut the number in half that you gave me for the per bed day rate. The behavioral health ROI is so big a lot of times you have to like minimize and make it conservative. So none of this takes into account some of the like one step beyond savings or anything like that. But you could build in here, I built models that then have the cost of crisis residential added in and like this one does that. But then like those step down things, you can add all of that in here and create really compelling and simple to understand information. Great. Um, let's move on to our next poll question. Um, and, and just so everybody knows, uh, the, the slides have been uploaded into the GoToWebinar platform. We will send an email out uh, after the session letting uh, with, with uh, the slides from today's session as well. All right, on to our next poll. This is um, just, you know, it's a pretty simple question, but it's, but it's, it's relevant because we have a lot of money funneled, being funneled into the crisis uh, continuum uh, at the federal level and, and subsequently to the state level uh, in the next year or two. So my question for the audience is this, what would you do with more money for your crisis system? Would you develop new programs? Would you increase wages for the current crisis staff? Would you improve technology or would you do something else? All right, five more seconds. Okay, we'll bring up the results now. The numbers were kind of close. 46% um, of, or excuse me, 43% of you said develop new programs or services. 36% said increase wages for current crisis staff. 7% said improved technology and 14% said other. Now, why don't we try and use the chat, excuse, excuse me, use the Q&A box as if it was chat. So for those of you that put other, I'd be curious to hear what you answered there. Um, and as we're, as we're waiting for just maybe one or two of those comments to come in, I just wanna reflect that much of the, uh, the dollars that are being uh, proposed or, or invested in the new administration um, 
infrastructure plan or the mental health block grant services are to increase funding for crisis services. And that doesn't necessarily just mean staffing, but it means development of new services. And the challenge can come when uh, you have the services that you need, but you can't pay the staff the wages that you need to pay them in order to keep them, especially in the job market right now, which other industries are also experiencing, um, is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I don't, I don't want to say cutthroat because it's it's more like very competitive. Um, some some industries are paying more than they normally would because they need people so desperately, and it's disincentivizing people from staying or entering into the behavioral health workforce. Okay, so um, we, I'll I'll check the the Q and A here in a, just a moment, but um, this is going to take us into uh, this. Roadmap the Ideal Crisis System is the newest document that's come out. This has been published by National Council for Behavioral Health, which is now the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, I believe, as of two weeks ago. Uh, and it was written by the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry. And they have some very interesting thoughts in this document about funding. I highly recommend that people check this out. Don't be afraid of the, you know, the 200-page length. Um, it can be, um, it can be a lot, but but it's important information. Um, the first is about shared resource contribution. That there shouldn't just be one funder that's contributing to this. But you know, if you happen to be saving the hospitals money by not um, getting ha having people boarded in the ED, perhaps they should be. Um, you know, channeling some of their dollars and their savings into the system. Um, there's also financing supports uh, that that it supports the capacity, not just the utilization. And this is kind of a move away from a just a strictly fee for service uh, model, but one that is um, considerate of uh, the need to keep the services open all the time, even when they're not being utilized. Uh, it, it also advocates for adequate reimbursement rates. Um, you know, Todd talked about his uh, 248 per day peer respite program. I know of a crisis residential program in Minnesota that's running on very similar rates. Now, remember, peer respites are entirely staffed by peer supports. What if you had to add um, a prescriber, uh, a nurse eight hours a day, um, you know, master's level clinicians, and then you still only got that same reimbursement? That's what some of the programs in Minnesota right now are experiencing. And that can be uh, very challenging when there's inequities between rates, even though the services cost approximately the same if you have the same type of staffing models. Uh, the report also talks about incentive payments and the importance of starting with bonuses and positive incentives first before you introduce negative incentives. So if any of you are fortunate enough to be in a community that is progressive enough to be in a value-based purchasing arrangement for behavioral health crisis services, then you know what we're talking about, that you would say, okay, normally we pay you, uh, you know, let's say $3 million a year to run this continuum of services. If you uh, meet these reporting requirements and, and give us your demographic information and your outcomes on time, you know, and you and you show some of these outcomes, we'll give you an extra 5%, you know, and then after you do that for about two years, then you say, okay, now there's going to be a withhold that takes place, which means we're going to pay you 95% of what we normally pay you, and then you can earn back that 5% by what you're expected to do, and then you can get a bonus if you go above and beyond when it comes to outcomes. Uh, a few more points that are that are um, touched on in the finance section of this roadmap is payment for all populations, including those with comorbidities. So we're trying to move away from just funding a system for people with Medicaid or with no insurance and starting to recognize that um, that equity or uh, parity in behavioral health means access to a, a crisis benefit. And so if the providers who are operating those services know how to do them well, then if somebody comes in with commercial health insurance or you know uh, the, the the veterans health plan or Medicare, why can't we get those payers to pay for that too? And why can't we get the provider um, uh, you know made whole for that uh, for that service? And then finally, financing for a, an entire safety net of services. Panelists, I'm just curious if there's any of these that stick out to you and your current experiences, or you know over the years of of what you've wanted out of your uh, the funding and sustainability for your systems. I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, 
I thought a lot about this and, you know, I, I, in preparation for this as well, I was like, okay, whatever I say, people aren't going to hold me to that. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, because the, the residential makeup is very similar to, you know, a hospital setting, you've got your team wrapped around there. You've got your, your provider, you've got your counselors, you've got your nursing staff, You've got your peer specialist, whatever that team makeup is, um, and we're fee for service for the programs that we don't have grant funding for. Um, and so, because of that, as I'm sure many on this webinar are familiar with, that the reimbursement of those services don't offset, you know, the cost of the operations. Um, so I've really liked the concept of those bundled payments, the episode of care payments. Um, but I know that, you know, there's a lot of movement towards value-based payments as well. And I think, you know, as a, a healthcare consumer myself, you know, I love the idea of value-based, you know, I want my provider to be incentivized to give me good care. Um, and I think about that, you know, in, as a provider role as well, um, of course, we want to provide really good quality care, um, but we also want to make sure that in this very unique crisis service that we are financially sustainable. And so for me, I really still lean towards, you know, that bundled payment system being preferred for the residential model. Um, and I also think like integral care, for example, we're also joint commission accredited. So I think a balance of having, you know, an external entity that is holding you accountable for a high standard of care, in addition to a bundled rate, can be a really good combination to, to kind of hit both of those worlds. And, and Tracy, I don't, <clears throat> uh, you know, you, you probably representing the, the, um, the experience of many crisis providers, I don't think crisis providers are saying, can you pay us to not work? Um, but you're, you're saying, you know, pay us uh, something fair to do this work and we will demonstrate our value. Um, you know, but I, I've always found that the fee for service crisis providers, it, it's like they have an extra layer of stress and, and strain on their system. It's already hard enough to provide crisis services, much less to be like, hey, every day we got to keep our beds 85 percent full or more. So, mm -hmm. you know, come on, let's go. Let's get this person out um, it, versus we, we determine that the service is valuable. You know, let's have collaborative ways to come to that solution of um you know are they being underutilized do you feel like you're paying too much how can we demonstrate that this is a good return on investment and have a um you know kind of a a collaborative and 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 progressive conversation about this not one that's just you're just trying to ask for more money no we're we're trying to provide a sustainable service and if you want the staff to be solid and you want you know the operations and the clinical outcomes and the clinical interventions this is this shouldn't be something considered unreasonable yeah all right uh and we're gonna go into me, our... travis go oh, go ahead todd sure yeah for me travis i i'm thinking uh of a couple things here um you had the first poll question and i i read um where you were funded and i seen philanthropy grants state grants in our region so I remember for philanthropy at the major hospital that uh, partners with us with the respite house uh, when i went there to present uh, one of the board members said so so even if you see that person three times you're still saving us money and so you know seeing that in incentive they really um started to say hey maybe we should do this and with that they've funded us for the last three years um this last time they funded us as a whole as an organization our um wellness recovery center and, and just the organization itself and you know with seeing the adequate reimbursement rates uh one of the things that i am advocating for in the state as well is the reimbursement rate for medicaid is one where they get 150 dollars flat so if a community mental health center has a peer specialist and they see somebody eight times in that month, it's a flat $150. And that's what's really 
holding back agencies in hiring peer specialists. Um, I know Iowa is one of the um, top ones for not really adequately reimbursing these agencies for peer support. And, and that's another reason that, you know, instead of taking a job as a peer specialist somebody, somewhere, I didn't want to go through what my brothers and sisters go through and the fact of um, they're, they're not treated as value because of that reimbursement rate. So doing what we do, it, it's, we show the value as a peer-run organization. I have like 60 uh, seconds, I'll go really fast, I promise. I think, my, my humble opinion on this is that we should treat this like a bootstrapped accountable care organization. I, you know, when I did the work with the emergency departments uh, for diversions, we were able to show, based upon the diversions that we were doing, so it was a, a third party service would evaluate every behavioral health consumer that came in the door, and they were able to shorten their door to disposition time from 23 hours to three hours, and then their, their uh, ED diversion rate was like 82%. And so all those numbers are great, but where's the money going and who's getting it? Well, the hospital is getting all of it. So we really dug into like, we got all the way down to like, like billing codes and everything and realized that we were returning 43,000 care hours to the hospitals instead of them having to work with these complex, like every hospital has a chart, the highest service uh, profit that they get and the lowest. And what you see is time and time again, is that the highest, the highest money they make is usually on orthopedics. The lowest money they make is on behavioral health. And the other chart is what's the highest cost of that. And it's usually flipped. And so what we did is like, we demonstrated this is what was being saved down to like a dollars and cents thing. I genuinely think that the way to solve some of these issues, especially in bigger communities, hospitals should be paying in. So should major health systems. If you're developing a crisis response uh, continuum of care, all of the upstream provider, oh, sorry, yeah, all the upstream acute providers are receiving demonstrable monetary benefit. If they're saving a million dollars, give me a half a million. You give a half a million to your profit, uh, to your profit line, and then we both win. And I think some of those things are ways that we could start to fund this instead of funding, you know, more wings and hospitals. I love it. Uh, I don't know um, if our hospital friends are listening, um, and we'll we're we're great people to get along with. So um, I, I'm sure we can find ways to make that happen. Let's get on to our, our third and final poll question uh, for today. <clears throat> our question is, uh, how has the funding of your uh, crisis programs, uh, crisis services been impacted by the pandemic? Um, so has your funding increased? Has it remained the same for crisis services? Has it decreased or are you unsure? So one way that you might um, you know, know is if you get paid regardless of utilization and your, um, uh, and your utilization went way down, then you may have increased dollars. I know of a lot of crisis providers that did work in a fee-for-service model, and so because their beds weren't full or because their mobile crisis team wasn't being dispatched, they subsequently um, you know, lost a, a lot of money. And maybe some of that was recouped through, uh, through federal grants or through uh, um, emergency assistance at the state or, or county level, um, but for others that it really left their crisis programs in a much worse place. Okay, um, about three more seconds on this one. Okay. We've got an honest group here, about 20% said that they were not sure. Um, and I'm getting those results up here right now. So 55% said funding remained the same for crisis services. 25% said it increased and 20% said unsure. That's really encouraging. You know, that's great to hear um, uh, that we didn't, ha we don't have any uh, participants right now around, um, uh, a, you know, who experience a decrease in crisis services. So <clears throat> that's going to bring us into this last discussion uh, question for our panelists, which is, um, you know, so obviously right here we've got a firehouse, and this phrase is being used a lot to describe how crisis services should be funded. So you don't pay per fire, usually, if you're a township or if you're a city or county. Um, you pay to keep the fire uh, house open regardless of how many fires there are in a day, week, or month. 
Um, in the same way, the, the argument is that crisis services should be paid for as if they are an essential service, you know, just like EMS and fire um, and, and law enforcement, and that the capacity should be there, the sustainability should be there when it comes to the funding. So here is my last question to um, our panel, which is how would you ideally fund your crisis services? And I have a couple examples here, uh, such as fee for service and grants and firehouse model and value-based purchasing. Um, Travis, before and, they happen, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're still sharing the poll, so we're not seeing. Um, I am so sharing. sorry. There you go, perfect. Thank you for bringing that up. Thanks for being here too, Miranda. Um, I. Uh, I really appreciate that. All right, so um, why don't I start with uh, Tracy on this question. Tracy, you know, you've got your, uh, a number of residential programs that you supervise. Um, if you had it your way, how would these services be funded? Yeah, so I, I may have jumped the gun and answered that a little bit earlier, but, you know, looking at the firehouse model, you know, it does make a lot of sense, again, because the types of services that we provide being kind of all in-house, multidisciplinary. Um, it makes sense that, you know, we just we need to be there and we need to be able to provide that financial support for that whole um, operation. Um, because we don't close, right? We, just like you said, Travis, you know, we're open 365 days a year. Austin, we just recently had this amazing ice storm that shut us down for a week. and residential, we just, we had to keep going, right? We still had uh, individuals in our care with, with critical needs. Um, and so it, despite the worst of the worst, we're still there. Um, and so to be able to have, you know, uh, the ideal funding source to be able to continue to support that no, no matter what um, things look like uh, is, is ideal. However, I also know that, you know, um, in the meantime, while we don't have that ideal scenario, we have to constantly look for opportunities um, to get us you know, where we need to be. And, and sustainability can look kind of piecemeal sometimes. Um, and that's, I think, kind of where we are uh, right now. And so things that I think about, especially looking towards the future, I don't know if y'all are familiar with um, the 988 uh, coming out, the 988 number. Um, you know, thinking about the opportunities that we might be able to, to have outside of that because of that. Um, it's going to increase opportunities for people to access mental health care, but it can't just stop there, right? We have to really build out our continuum of care to meet that need. Otherwise, we're just going to have a bottleneck of people reaching out for care and not having that continuum uh, uh, for them to, somewhere for them to go. And we also know that, you know, according to SAMHSA and the best practice, residential is a part of best practice in the continuum of care. So for me, you know, really looking at what are these available opportunities, places that we can advocate for ourselves um, for these types of opportunities. Um, another thing that I, I think a lot about is um, the IMD rule, if y'all are familiar with that. Um, it's a very archaic rule. Um, when I was looking at it more recently, it just it stands out to me that it was, you know, developed in the uh, if I remember the 60s, I believe, and the last time it was updated was in 1988. Uh, and so <laughs> I think it's time, you know, to revisit, you know, what type of reimbursement Medicaid is allowing for residential type programs. Like I had mentioned earlier on. We have two 16 bed facilities and two facilities that are far beyond 16 beds. So the IMD rule applies to those two programs. So we have, you know, we, we lose out on reimbursement through Medicaid because of that. So when there are advocacy opportunities, um, I, I think it's important for us to make sure we're paying attention to those along the way um, and making sure that, you know, our ideal, we're helping get to our, our ideal by advocating for things such as this. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Tom, let's go to you. It sounds like, um, you know, you've been, uh, you've experienced, uh, a, uh, you've had a positive experience so far with your funders and, and them funding even more of your services, but, but if you had it your way, how would you fund the, the crisis services like yours and others? 
think what Tracy said, you know, just to add to that is one of the things that, uh, you know, looking at that firehouse model and the fee for service, uh, I, I would I want a little bit of both, to be honest with you. Why not? Um, you know, I've been talking with our state and our mental health block grant does not include peer run organizations. Um, we're given 70% of that money to community mental health centers that receive Medicaid, private insurance, grants from SAMHSA. So now our state's just giving them a little bit more money. But what about us? What about the actual evidence based practice, practice that we're doing? So I really see, you know, part of that mental health block grant. Uh, I really want to try to see Iowa become like Wisconsin. Wisconsin has three peer run respites, and that's because of the advocacy that they've done at the state level so that it's actually out there that a um, million dollars is funded uh, through the legislation to fund the peer respites. Uh, that's what I'd really like it to look like. And, you know, grants are okay, but that's like planting a garden, right? You know, I'm going to give you the seeds. Now you've got to water them, you've got to plant them and watch them grow. Um, so many grants don't want to do consistent funding. Uh, and the fee for service can be okay, not during a pandemic, that's for sure. Um, my region has been very supportive. You know, they probably fund us close to 80% uh, of the funding that we need. And through that, when the pandemic happened, um, we were able to still keep our employees working because we knew that people were going to still need that service. Um, now, we weren't able to actually bring them in for a month. We did have to close, but we turned that into a 24-7 support line where people could actually call and talk to somebody. And my region seen the value in that and didn't cut any of our funding. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, the first year that they funded us through the crisis services, they seen it, the value of how many people we served that first year and said, hey, we need to give them some more money. So they were able to give us a little bit more money. So I, I think, you know, the fire, the firehouse model is good. Uh, a little bit of fee for service wouldn't be bad because I'm also thinking the fact that I've, I've accepted people that were on the other side of Iowa. Now, if the majority of my money is funded by my region's crisis services and my area hospital, if I accept that person, which I have to come here, my region's paying for that region's person. Yeah. So I'm looking at, hey, maybe contract with other regions for a fee for service. Todd, that's a great point. And we don't have time to get really down in the weeds of 988, but Tracy mentioned it earlier. And that's another reservation that some communities have had with funding uh, call centers that operate the, you know, that, that are National Suicide Prevention Lifeline members and subsequently will be 988 members is why are our local dollars, let's say from United Way, going to fund uh, the crisis support for people outside of our community. Um, you know, for those with a statewide or with a regional, you know, uh, ambition or set of priorities, that makes sense. But for those that want local dollars to be spent on, on local individuals, uh, that, can, um, uh, th that can be a deterrent. Uh, Hudson, uh, you are uh, the last respondent to this question. How would you ideally fund crisis services? And I think. <laughs> sorry, I have a snoring bulldog next to me, and she gets kind of loud, so I don't want everybody to hear it. Uh, I, I, a bootstrapped accountable care organization. I just keep coming back to that time and again is the best way to fund this. Is that I think we avoid a lot of the uh, the 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 this is my community, your community funding, which is a humongous issue. I think a lot of times, like I, I worked at one hotline that was sixty thousand inbound calls a year, and maybe fifteen percent were from like outside the region, and they still have to answer them. So I think if we're looking at you know what Mtala does for uh, for emergency medicine and the the you know you have to serve everybody regardless of you know their ability to pay, I think that it, it squares out for me that we put it on the hospitals. They're making money. They're you know and they will get the benefits that they will reap from a well functioning and healthy crisis response network is humongous. Like it's just unbelievable. Like what the the impact that you can have in these hospitals. So I think I always go after the money. And that's where most of the money is. And like, I'm not like saying let's target small hospitals that don't have a lot of resources. There's still to be other funding solutions, 
but I look at like what's the biggest piece of the pie that we could go after. And like, there's a lot of big communities that could do it. And like, we don't have to build more beds. We don't have to increase psychiatric facilities. Like the Austin State Hospital redesign effort, like go UT, first like humongous, well-funded study on what we needed for psychiatric care and psych psychiatric services, no new beds. They built a new facility or well, they're, I think they're wet, they're, they're sealing it soon, but they're not building an additional bed structure because they believe it's moving it to the community is where it belongs. And if that's the case, then we have to get the people that are gonna benefit from that to contribute in. Um, otherwise, it's just going to bottom line profits for hospitals. And like, I'll just go back again and again to like, I sat in a meeting and we had a million dollars to spend in one year on behavioral health. I'm like, let's do this program and let's do this program. And someone said, yeah, but a million dollars is just gonna disappear in six months. So you take a six months to spin up services, you know, a month or two to get staff, all this stuff, and then it's gone invest in the force multipliers, you know, whether it's technology, whether it's better system design, but even investing in consulting groups or lobbying groups to work to get the hospital organizations to pay into an ACO is really where I, I, I'd put my chips. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, Miranda, feel free to um, hop in now. I know we've had a couple questions that have come up in the Q&A, and we now have about seven minutes or so to get to those. Sure. Okay. So, um, we have a specific question for Tracy. Tracy, could you talk a little bit more about um, embedding mental health professionals with 911? Yes, I can talk about what we've done. Um, we've built a pretty strong partnership with our local law enforcement um, starting seven plus years ago when we developed our uh, mobile crisis outreach team um, response co-response with law enforcement. Um, since that time, it's evolved to where we're co-responding with EMS as well. Uh, law enforcement and EMS can dispatch our mobile crisis team directly into the field for calls. And just over time, that relationship has developed into this additional opportunity to embed um, mental health professionals into the 911 call center. Um, and so we've got integral care licensed counselors, licensed therapists that um, essentially sit in the call center and it can um, be navigated in a couple of ways. Uh, the call taker, the dispatcher um, can listen to the call and decide, okay, that this is primarily mental health. There's not a public safety risk. There's not a medical concern and move it over to the mental health professional. And that mental health professional has direct access to our mobile crisis team. And so if need be, if what is going on can't be resolved over that phone call, we end up dispatching our mobile crisis team out in the field to do that crisis work and that crisis intervention. Um, so that's kind of in a really small nutshell kind of how it's operating, but it really starts with having a, a really strong relationship um, with the local law enforcement, because as you can imagine, that's a, a major partnership and a major uh, need for trust across the board to develop something successful like that. Great, thank you so much. A similar kind of vein in terms of thinking about partnership and integration. Does anybody on the panel have experience or ideas around um, integrating primary care with your crisis services? I see Hudson nodding his head. Yeah, it's humongous. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it can be controversial in some communities, but you look at the place that really did it well, Detroit, the uh, Henry Ford Health System, uh, the birthplace of zero suicide, they had a suicide rate that was nine and a half times the national average, and they worked to integrate behavioral health screening and crisis services all the way down to like the door of primary care services. Um, and that was what they figured out was like the way to really impact their community. And they went to from four and a half or nine, I, it was it was like four and a half times or nine and a half times. My number's not my strong suit, except for that calculator. That one's really good. Um, other than that, uh, and they went, they did 32 months of no suicides. Um, and so, you know, the, the ability to integrate behavioral health uh, is critical. It's almost like we never should have split them apart and we should have integrated behavioral health and, you know, primary care at, at a root level. And like, I think, we're starting to see some changes of that. If you're bored and want to write a letter, uh, the support for families with the opioid bill, uh, legislation names also not my strong suit, uh, that came out and was signed actually had a provision that authorized CMS to bring behavioral health providers, psychiatric providers, 
and substance abuse writers into meaningful use. They were left out of the $40 billion gold rush that has happened since 2012 on incentivizing providers to do that. And so, you know, it's that's where we have to like really focus. We have to get it down to that root level. And that's also going to work on destigmatization. That's going to work on diversion. Like it's across the board going to be really, really helpful. Oh, and train doctors to know about behavioral health stuff and crisis stuff as opposed to like the 1% training they get right now. That'd be good too. Miranda, we've got time for probably one more question. Okay, great. Um, last question. This is, was specifically asked to Hudson, but I think it's uh, welcome for anybody's feedback. If there are publications that you recommend around some of the information that you've spoken today around uh, specific to diversion and care coordination. Hmm. I mean, there's some good treatises out there on care coordination that are kind of the standards of how people are doing it. There's been some research. Um, as for regular publications, I don't know, Tracy, Todd, do you guys have anything that you know of? I mean, I know specific things, but not something that's like more dedicated towards it. Well, I don't really know. Yeah, to answer that, not really, but I do know for peer respites, one of the things that I, I work closely with is the peerrespite.net. It'll give you a guide to every peer respite there is in the United States, phone numbers, emails, um, what is a peer respite, how does it help in the crisis services and diversion and step down. So the peerrespite.net would be a good one. I think also looking at the, you know, SAMHSA's best practice toolkit, um, you know, it really does describe what a, a healthy continuum of care is. And part of that is coordination and collaboration of services and that warm linkage for someone from throughout their throughout their episode. Also, if I don't if you don't mind real quick, I wanted to jump back to the um, uh, provider piece um, and, and incorporating primary care. Um, there's, you know, I don't know if many of y'all are familiar with CCBHCs, the Certified Community Behavioral Health clinic, it's a mouthful, um, but I encourage you to look into that. That's, you know, a way to, you know, becoming a certified behavioral health clinic. It helps really support that integration of primary care and mental health care. Um, so that's just a, a plug for that and something to do some research on to help you get there. And they're expanding and doing big expansion grants. And it's absolutely amazing. And Texas, who didn't get selected, was like, screw you guys, we're going to do it anyway. And then just like rolled it out. And it, like, it's been amazing. So like, even your states can just go rogue like Texas, like, we're doing it no matter what. <laughs> we did. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's the only model that I really support that, that rate or that capitated rate or the bundled payments, because then it's actually wrapping in not just the services, but innovation, growth, workforce development, all this other stuff. Like the CCBHC model is beautiful. Um, that is going to do it for our panel. I want to thank uh, Tracy and Todd and Hudson for being here. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to share this conversation together. Um, and uh, I, I just appreciate all your insights and what you're doing in the industry. Um, it's, it's, it's truly been a pleasure, so thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over to Miranda to close us out. Great, thank you, Travis. And yes, thank you, the three of you for being here today. And thank you all for attending today. Um, all registered attendees are gonna receive a survey via email, so be on the lookout for that survey. It's gonna cover things like your overall experience um, of the webinar today, but it's also gonna serve as your gateway to receive more information um, and give you some information about how you might get involved in any of the supporting organizations today. Um, and I'm glad that there was a question about further resources. There are some wonderful resources that you can access post-webinar as well. I know Travis shared um, a paper that TBD published in the chat you can also email info at tbdsolutions.com uh, to receive a further learning resource that's going to provide some crisis service information that you can read, watch, or listen to, and report on funding resources that are available. As a big thank you for being here live today. If you want to get involved in our organizations, um, you can uh, go to any of the websites that you see here. Um, 
And uh, just so you know, all four of these organizations have crisis specific conferences uh, that take place either this, in the spring or in the fall. So if you wanna get together with colleagues, either virtually or in person, uh, check out their websites and find out about all of the great stuff happening there. And if you wanna to reach today's panelists, uh, you can find our contact information um, right here. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you so much again for being here and we hope that you uh, enjoy the rest of your day.